let's talk about some treasures. So treasures are defined in the comprehensive rules in rule 111.10a as colorless artifact tokens with tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color. They were introduced in the Ixalan block and they are one of the artifact types that are called out in the rules. Currently, that list includes things such as clue, contraption, equipment, food, fortification, gold, treasure, and vehicle. So there's not too many, one of which is an unset only. Another is, what was that, future site for fortification and has never been used anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a pretty small pool of cards. Treasures have basically replaced gold. Gold debuted in the Theros block. The main difference between the two is that Treasure tokens require you to tap and sacrifice them for mana, and gold tokens merely require that you sacrifice it. No tapping is required at all. According to Mark Rosewater, he was asked about this at one point and responded, the reason that treasure was created was because gold was causing some issue in playtesting with certain mechanics, notably improvise in the Kaladesh block. That would have allowed tokens to double up on mana production, first tapping to pay for improvise and then sacking for mana. They didn't really like that, so they went, hey, what if you just had to tap it, and treasures were born. Yeah, it would have been one of those weird gotcha moments where a new player would look at that and say, that seems that seems wrong, how can you do that? So it was probably a really good call, and treasure's also a lot more generic of a term than gold, as we've seen on the various ways they've represented treasure tokens throughout the years. Yeah, I do like that the tokens have a lot of variety, so you can treasure chests. You can get ones that have, like there's an Orzhov emblem, a couple other pretty cool looking things. The one from Strixhaven is actually really cool. It's just a giant piece of bling floating in midair glowing. Oh yes, yeah, the like Prismari looking thing. Oh yeah. I don't know, it's it's fancy. It's funny that you mentioned that because I was literally thinking as Jake was saying it that gold only represents itself as like a gold medal or just a hunk on some of the token cards and all the treasures look great. You did mention Ixalan. Ixalan has a treasure for each of the different tribes represented in Ixalan. So the Merfolk one looks different from vampires, looks different from pirates. It's really cool. Oh, that's a cool touch, yeah. I don't, I don't think I ever noticed that. I may or may not have a decent collection of foil treasure tokens for <laughs> the purpose of dragon on shiny treasure deck. <laughs> so speaking of tokens, all the treasures have been tokens until very recently. The first non-token treasure to be printed was the Mimic from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. There's also another card in that set that turns existing permanents into treasure. That would be Minimus Containment. So look at that. We've got actual permanents that are treasures. So now that we know where treasures came from, what, what do they actually do? Treasure in magic is basically just stored temporary mana. The concept of mana ramp is nothing new. Alpha, the very first set, had all the basics covered. There were mana dorks like Bird of Paradise and Llanowar Elves, which are seen everywhere today. There were mana rocks ranging from Basalt Monolith to the series of Moxon. There were one-shot ritual effects like Dark Ritual and Channel, and even some enchantment-based ramp like Wild Growth. Treasure is a little different, though, and I think its closest companion in this set would be Black Lotus. So it's mana that's stored in artifact form on the battlefield. It has little to no opportunity cost to get it out, and it's waiting for you to use it in one glorious burst. That's a that's a hell of a comparison there. It is. It's kind of over the top, but if we were going for alpha, it's, it's really all I had. <laughs> I guess a, a better comparison would be from Tempest when Lotus Petal was created, which is the text is actually the same as treasure. If you tap and sacrifice it, you add one mana of any color. And That's it. Just yep. like Black Lotus, Lotus Petal costs zero mana to cast. So one of the big differences between Lotus Petal and Treasures is that Lotus Petal actually is a card in your deck. So you have to waste a turn drawing it or it will take up one of the spots in your opening hand, that kind of stuff. While aside from Mimic, all the treasures in your deck will be created from other cards. That's a really good point. I actually have to shout out Bust from our CDH play group that Jake and I are in. Bust was once counseling me when I was telling him about the Malcolm Kettis deck I was brewing. And he said, look, you really should think of every time Malcolm hits, you are getting to play a free Lotus Petal. And Lotus Petal is a card that is good enough to devote a slot to in a lot of CDH decks. So you are essentially drawing and playing a Lotus Petal. 
And with your deck, you're drawing and playing three Lotus Petals. So the floor on a treasure is actually fairly significant the more powerful and faster your games are. Yeah, the opportunity cost of taking up a card in your deck is a lot higher than a lot of players initially think of. That's why I know when I first started playing, I looked at Ornithopter and went, wow, it's zero mana for a 0-2 flyer. What a fantastic deal. And Ornithopter would wind up in a lot of my decks. It had absolutely no synergy with anything I was doing. It was actually pretty bad, but in my mind, it was free because I was equating mana cost with opportunity cost. It, it's still a card. You still have to waste a turn drawing it. You have to waste one of your resources in drawing extra cards, you know. So it's it's not a free inclusion, even though the mana cost is free. That's a really good point. So for the current state of the game, there's about 90 cards that reference treasure tokens. They're spread out across all five colors. Not very evenly, but they are spread out across all five colors. White has three, blue has 11, black has 17, red has the lion's share at 28, green has eight, and there are currently 13 multicolored, which are mostly red and blue, and then there are 10 colorless cards that reference or create treasure tokens. It definitely seems to be a primarily red mechanic. Black's been kind of leaning into it. It's, it's interesting, especially for white, because of the three cards, only Two generate treasures for you. One of them generates it for the opponent. It's which it makes yikes. sense. It makes a lot of sense for red to be getting the lion's share of this. As I think the a very close approximation for treasure tokens is to the idea of a ritual which you can save. Rituals going back to original alpha with dark ritual. Pay a mana, get three mana. You have to use it immediately, or then it's gone. Red being this color that has kind of taken over rituals from black as a primary means, it seems like a really flavorful way for red to kind of bank some mana, kind of get some mana back. Makes a lot of sense in red, and I love it in red. It has some thematic similarities to the impulsive draw mechanic as well, I think, which is also very red. It's kind of like impulsive mana. You you can have it banked and then use it one time and then it's gone and you're back to where you were. Mm-hmm. So while I was looking at the different types of treasure cards, I noticed that there were, broadly speaking, two different categories. There's the kind of card where treasure generation is just tacked onto it as a, a small upside, kind of like how some sets have just the basic cards that tack on the set mechanic or a cantrip, something like that. In this case, the focus of the card is usually on the other effect, and the treasure gener generation is just a small incidental bonus. And this would be stuff like Deadly Dispute or Prosperous Innkeeper from a recent set. Unfortunately, I have noticed that a lot of these kind of seem to be costed or, or created primarily for limited, like sealed and draft. They're a little expensive mana-wise for an eternal format, like EDH. And they mostly exist to showcase the treasure mechanic on just the required staple effects that any limited environment needs. Stuff like Grim Bounty or Pirate's Prized, Improvised Weaponry, that kind of stuff. Some of them still do wind up making the cut, but you should be very picky when you're looking at the draft commons and uncommons for which ones will wind up making the cut for your deck. Try to compare them to cards that you are already running, both in terms of mana value and then what the effect will be, and use that to make the decision for those types of effects. And likewise, the other types of these treasure cards are the ones that primarily focus on the treasure generation itself, either as a one-time ritual effect or if it's a permanent that's sitting out as a recurring mana engine. Like one of the most iconic engines would be Smothering Tithe. Smothering Tithe is three and a white for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If the player doesn't, you create a colorless artifact token with tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color. I, I think that Smothering Tithe is very well known and has quickly become a white staple. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Um, and on the other side, if we're looking at the ritual effects, there's another very well-known, commonly played ritual in Dockside Extortionist. Dockside Extortionist is a goblin pirate for one generic and a red. 
When it enters the battlefield, create X treasure tokens, where X is the number of artifacts and enchantments your opponents control. It is good in regular commander. It is great in CDH. It was too good. <laughs> and then there's also a couple other cards that I, I slotted into this category, such as Grim Hireling from the new commander set from Forgotten Realms. It is a tiefling rogue for three generic and a black, 3-2. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create two treasure tokens. And it has an activated ability of black and sacrifice X treasures. Target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. So some ramp and some removal. Uh, there's also Stormkiln Artist. Slightly older card from Strixhaven. Stormkiln Artist is three and a red for a 2-2 two -two creature dwarf shaman. Stormkiln Artist gets plus one plus zero for each artifact you control. And it gets those artifacts from Magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, create a treasure. It is a very useful way to generate lots of mana in Spellslinger type decks. And let's just hit on one more card, also from Adventure in the Forgotten Realms. This is Old Gnawbone. Alex, why don't you take this one? Because <laughs> I'm super excited about it. Old Gnawbone is a legendary creature dragon for 7 mana, 5 and 2 green. It's also a 7-7. Seven, seven. It simply says, whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, create that many treasure tokens. Yeah. I'm all about that. Mm -hmm. Those dragons love their treasure, all right. And then there's also a couple cards that fit in both categories at the same time. They're the cards that have a great main effect, and they're great generation generators of treasure tokens. Let's talk about Hull Breacher, right? Oh, we don't have to do that anymore. Oh, it's true. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, let's talk about Reckless Endeavor. Reckless Endeavor is another card from the black-red precon from Forgotten Realms Commander. It is a sorcery for five generic and two red. It says, roll 2d12 and choose one result. Reckless Endeavor deals damage equal to that result to each creature. Then create a number of treasure tokens equal to the other result. So when this card was first spoiled, I was hanging out in the mono red discord. And I, I swear for like five days, everyone was just really confused. Like nobody had any idea how good this card was. They're like, is this just unplayable random red card? Is this actually good? What's going on? I think the current consensus is that the card is a lot better than it looks. There is not as much randomization since you do get to choose the die roll. And specifically in the CEDH environment, you don't need a really high number of damage to do an effective board wipe. Uh, there is- I think like three or four gets rid of just about everything relevant five if there's a Kenrith. Yeah. Most of the relevant stacks pieces are even at like one, two, and three. Yeah. And then some of the commanders can be a little bit higher. But honestly, if you can knock out Dranith Magistrate at three, you're, you're going to cover most of your bases. There is a user, Lazy, in the Mono Red Discord who sat down, did the math, and made a nice little Excel chart. We'll stick it in the video and hopefully be able to put a link to it in the comments or in the show Damn. notes. Cool. Thanks, John. And it, it shows the results of the different die roll, the probabilities. And something that's it's pretty interesting, if you just need three damage to wipe the board, you have a 52% chance of generating at least eight treasures, which already pays for the spell itself and serves as ramp because you get one more treasure. Like that's over a 50% chance to do that. And it, I don't know, it just kind of seems worse than I think it will play out to be. And I'm really looking forward to trying this card out. It does look pretty sweet. Uh, in particular, it's definitely finding a spot in my Goto list. Oh God, yes. Uh, because you can even use it just as ramp. Like if there is no requirement to wipe the board or anything, you're at 56% chance on casting this to get nine treasures. That's Crazy. That's great. Like <laughs> it's just weird. It's such a weird card. So that's the rough categories of treasure. Are there any other particular treasure cards that you guys wanted to talk about? There is one that is kind of a pet card of mine that I really enjoy, and that is Gadrock the Crown Scourge. This is a little dragon from Corset 2021. It is a 5-4 
Legendary Creature Dragon for 2 and a red with flying. Gadra can't attack unless you control 4 or more artifacts. At the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token for each non-token creature that died this turn. As the head of its own deck, I have tried to experiment with this, and it is really difficult to get enough reliable removal to get that value. And Gadrek himself is not too great of a win condition in the command zone. But as one of the 99, I have seen some impressive things that you can do. I think the home that this wants is going to be in some kind of a deck where you can reliably remove creatures. And that's what I'm trying him out as one of the 99 in that gruel Nyeth of the Dire Hunt deck. Nice. There are two that kind of, a couple that come to mind for me as I've been thinking about this dragon treasure deck. Two of them are relatively recent additions. One from Modern Horizons and one from Adventures in Forgotten Realm. The one from Modern Horizons is Crack Open for three mana and a sorcery. You get to destroy target artifact or enchantment and create a treasure token. So it gives you the option to destroy an artifact and then also ramp a little bit and kind of recoup whatever mana you spent. I don't think it's going to see play in any CEDH decks, but some casual ones like the Corval deck I'm, I'm building for uh, Treasure Dragons, I'm probably going to slot it in for removal and just moving my game plan forward of having treasures. The other one, you find a Cursed Idol from Adventures in Forgotten Realms, is a bit more modular. It costs one less mana, so it's just one in a green. And choose one. Destroy target artifact, destroy target enchantment, or create a treasure token and venture into a dungeon. So it is one mana less. They are both sorcery speeds, but the modular option gives you a, a bit more choice on what you want to do. You draw it early enough, there's no artifact or enchantment to destroy, you get to ramp. Late game, you're fine on mana, but you need to just remove an artifact or enchantment, it's there, and you're good to go. The last one I have on my radar is Treasure Vault, and it is one of the new lands from Adventures in Forgotten Realm, and essentially it allows you to bank mana, and upon sacrificing Treasure Vault, turn it into X treasures. There are some major drawbacks to where you actually have to sacrifice the land, and you lose that, and you essentially are, as John made a good point earlier, for the same price, you are creating an Arcane Signet, essentially. But in the Treasure Dragons deck, utilizing Corvold with a bit of a land recurrence, it definitely falls into the, the greedy fantasy I want to build for the deck. And involving treasures, so it's really cool. Speaking of venturing into the dungeon, there is two of the dungeons. The Dungeon of the Mad Mage and Lost Mine of Fandelver have rooms that create treasure tokens. So if you do have a reliable way of venturing, you can create treasures that way. One such way would be with Aserak the Arklich. I have no idea if that's how you say his name, but we're going to go with that. It's a legendary creature from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Two generic and a black for a legendary zombie wizard. It's a 5-5, so three mana 5-5. When it enters the battlefield, if you haven't completed Tomb of Annihilation, return Aserak the Archlich to its owner's hand and venture into the dungeon. And when he attacks for each opponent, you create a 2-2 black zombie creature token, unless that player sacrifices a creature. So the main thing here, you can combo him with Aluren, which is an enchantment from Tempest for two generic and two green. Any player may cast creature spells with mana value three or less without paying their mana costs and as though they had flash. So this is just a, an infinite combo right here, as long as you have not completed Tomb of Annihilation. You just flash in Aserak. He realizes you haven't completed the Tomb of Annihilation, so you venture into a dungeon and he bounces back to your hand. And you just repeat this forever while you're venturing into Lost Mines of Fandelver or Dungeon of the Mad Mage. So this is a way to get infinite treasures. Although while you're doing it, you'll also get infinite life and infinite card draw and infinite token creatures and deal <laughs> infinite damage to your opponents. So, I mean, the treasures are not quite as exciting there, but it is a way to get infinite treasures. There's also some ways to just boost the number of treasures you're creating. From the new Adventures in the Forgotten Realm set, we have Zorn. Zorn is two and a red for a 3-2 creature elemental. If you would create one or more treasure tokens, instead, create those tokens plus an additional treasure token. Just when you create one, create two instead. Your own mini parallel lives. Also, the art is really weird. Oh, Zorns are really weird. If you think the art on the normal Zorn is weird, you should look at the playbook version of Zorn. It is absolutely terrifying. One other one. This is a, a, a bit older, probably the oldest card in terms of recent sense we're discussing. Magda Brazen Outlaw from Kaldheim. 
Magda Brazen Outlaw is a legendary dwarf, or a legendary creature dwarf berserker for two mana, one and a red, two, one. Other dwarves you control get plus one, plus zero. That's neat. Whenever a dwarf you control becomes tapped, create a treasure token. And then sacrifice, sacrifice five treasures, search your library for an artifact or dragon card, put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Now, the first deck that came to mind when I saw Bradman start talking about token was John's Torbrand deck. Uh, because, yeah, take it away, I, John. I looked into it. I don't have any other dwarves in the deck, and I don't have a lot of treasure synergy with the deck either. I don't have a lot, of, in spite of being mono red, I didn't run a lot of ways to generate treasures in the deck. So while it would have been fair in a lot of ways, I would have probably then been taking out some of the goblin synergies that the deck does use as win conditions. So having one more piece of ramp in exchange for a win condition just didn't seem like the right play for Torbrand. But the deck is sweet, the, the actual Magda deck, and there are definitely homes for this card. So I'm thinking of including it in my Treasure Dragons deck, not necessarily for the attacking and creating a treasure token when a dwarf attacks, but more for the option to just sacrifice five treasures, which the deck is going to be want to generating a lot of anyways, in order for me to get old Gnawbone sooner rather than later. That just sounds sweet. That's pretty cool. It also touches on some things you can do with treasures. So what can you do with treasures? Uh, you can use them to cast spells, which is kind of the base level thing to do with a treasure token. You use it to make mana. You use that mana to play spells. It does really do a nice job at that since treasures can produce any color of mana, though. It's not just producing a colorless mana. It produces any color of mana. So you can run some really greedy decks that are running cards that have a lot of colored mana pips in them. Jake, one of the examples you've used is niv Mizzet Perun. The version of Niz is it that costs red, 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 blue, blue, blue. And when you have a pile of treasures, it's kind of trivial to cast those types of spells. Yeah, that casting cost is far more difficult to hit in a lot of times when you're playing the deck than you might initially think. I took it for a spin a few times, and there were plenty of occasions where I was looking at, you know, three blue, two red, and a bunch of colorless, and I'm just like, come on, I want to cast my stupid commander. <laughs> Uh, and it's also, you know, mana ramp. Basically, you're able to get ahead of the one land per turn restriction that the base rules of magic have in place. So aside from mana, what else can you do with them? Well, they're artifact tokens, right? So you can use them for artifact synergy. One of the ways that you can take advantage of this is improvise. So yes, they were specifically created so that they couldn't double dip like gold tokens would with improvise, but you can still use them for improvise. You can tap and effectively use them as one mana for an improvised spell without having to sacrifice it. There are 17 cards with improvise. Some are better than others. One of note is War of Invention, and it's a to-the-battlefield artifact tutor. And then there's another one that grants all of your non-artifact spells improvise. This would be Inspiring Statuary. So this would effectively let all your treasure tokens continually make mana without having to go to the bin after one shot. From a rules note, there are also ways that you can actually double dip for the value from your treasure tokens, and that is with Affinity. So Affinity is going to look at the cost of the spell when you have it on the stack before you actually pay for it. A lot of us old school players are used to tapping for mana, floating the mana, and then spending it on the card that we are trying to resolve. However, technically what you do is you put the card onto the stack, you announce all the modes, determine what the cost is going to be, and then you pay for it. So if you have a card that has affinity for artifacts, such as our old classic Frogmite, a 4-mana 2-2, if you control two treasures, and those are your only untapped sources of mana, you put Frogmite onto the stack, it sees there are two artifacts in play, Frogmite's cost is reduced by two, and then you can lock that cost in at two mana, tap and sacrifice your two treasures, Frogmite's cost remains locked in at two mana, and you successfully crashed Frogmite. If you're running a deck that has Tezzeret, Master of the Bridge, this was an Aether Revolt Tezzeret Planeswalker who essentially gives all of your creature and Planeswalker spells affinity for artifacts, it can be a very useful way to stretch your mana a little bit farther. Another mechanic that synergizes well with treasures is Metalcraft. This is a 
mechanic that turns on if you have three or more artifacts in play. And treasures are artifacts, so it's a pretty reliable way to turn Metalcraft on. These are cards such as Mox Opal or Pure Steel Paladin, Dispatch, that kind of stuff. Dispatch is a little bit more of a niche one. So that is a simply a white, man- white instant for a single white mana, which says tap target creature. Then Metalcraft, if you control three or more artifacts, go ahead and exile that creature instead. Yeah, that's definitely a more niche effect, but it could be like your third copy of Path to Exile slash Swords to Plowshares if you're in a white deck that needs some removal and also has treasures. That's what it is in my Scrappy Cat deck. There's a couple other specific cards that play well. There's Gearaper Aethergrid. Aethergrid. That will allow you to tap two untapped artifacts you control to deal one damage to a target. Uh, It's not terribly useful, but I've I've had a a non-commander casual deck that used that before, and it was pretty fun. There's also Whirler Rogue, a blue creature that when it comes into play creates two Thopter tokens. But the main thing here is that you can tap an artifact you control to give a creature, or I'm sorry, tap two artifacts you control to give a creature cannot be blocked this turn. So you can get some evasion out of this for your Voltron commander or any other large beater that you want to get through unopposed. The other thing that's important that's come up a few times in our discussion with treasure tokens is that you have to sacrifice them in order to extract the mana from them. We've already talked a few times about Korvold, and we'll talk about the big dragon daddy in a few more minutes, but it also does play well with a few cards in a kind of artifacts aristocrat style of deck. There are both Disciple of the Vault at one mana and Marionette Master at six mana, both of which have a similar effect of whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from play, you can ping opponents for damage. There are not quite enough of these to really make it pay off in a true aristocrat-style deck, but give it a few more years. We keep coming back to artifact sets. We'll probably get there eventually. I would also like to add Mayhem Devil to this list. It's another deal damage based off sacrificing things. So it's, you know, your third instance of this, but... Yeah, you might still want a little bit more redundancy in this before it becomes a dedicated win condition. Not quite. Sacrificing, this is in the same vein of being able to kind of utilize them as being tokens to the same extent. The opposite of Disciple of the Vault, so to speak. Reckless Fireweaver from Kaladesh. So if a Disciple of the Vault counts artifacts leaving the battlefield from sacrificing them, Reckless Fireweaver does roughly the same thing, but when they come into play instead. So it is a two mana, one in a red for a human artificer. It's a one three. And it simply says, whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, Reckless Fireweaver deals one damage to each opponent. Oh, hey, that's a good inclusion for this list. And, and using the, the magic word for them, treasures are in fact tokens. So any of you that have ever heard me talk on here before knows that I have a affinity for tokens. John gives me a hard time for it all the time, but I love them. And the good thing about tokens is you can double them. So you've got effects like doubling season, anointed profession, Parallel or procession, not profession. Parallel lives and the new commanders out of the Strixhaven, Adrix and Nev Twincasters, which are good ways to take advantage of doubling up on tokens. Everyone loves more free mana. Mm-hmm. They're also fairly disposable since they are just things that you can generate without too much effort a lot of the time. So you can use them as cheap sacrifice fodder. Any kind of effect that requires you to sacrifice a permanent or sacrifice an artifact. Uh, of note, there are a few red cards. There's Goblin Welder, Goblin Engineer, and Doretti Scrap Savant. These all allow you to sacrifice an artifact to bring an artifact out of your graveyard into play. And it's a pretty good exchange rate when you're you know, tossing out a, a treasure token in order to get back, I don't know, uh, Bolus's Citadel or whatever giant artifact that you don't really want to pay the cost for. Or maybe somebody already removed it and you want to just get it back. And of course, there are a few very fun ways to win the game with alternate win conditions with treasures. Revel in Riches is a well-known and well-tread ground. If you control 10 or more treasures on this 5 mana black enchantment, you win the game. And it gives you treasures for your opponent's creatures dying. Mechanized Production is another favored alternate win condition for 2 and 2 blue. You can make copies of an artifact, and if you control eight or more artifacts with the same name, you win the game. Finally, there's Old Reliable Hellkite Tyrant. It is a big old dragon. It is a 6-5 for 4 red red flying trample. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, 
gain control of all artifacts that player controls. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control 20 or more artifacts, you win the game. I love Hellkite Tyrant. I have been putting it in decks for a long time. I have never, ever gotten it to go off like that, but I really want to, and at some point I will. One other win condition for treasure tokens, especially if you have them in mass, and something I haven't really talked about too much, is the ability to actually turn them into creatures. The last time I ever played Standard in any meaningful format was back in 2015 when Ensoul Artifact was running rampant. And with the release of Modern Horizons 2 not that long ago, we were given a new card called Rise and Shine. It is a two-mana sorcery, one in a blue. Target non-creature artifact you control becomes a 0-0 artifact creature. Put four plus one plus one counters on each artifact that became a creature this way. Rise and Shine also has an overload cost for six, four, and two blue. You may cast it for its overload cost if you do change text by placing all instances of target with each. So if you have an abundance of treasure tokens on the battlefield, you can create a giant 4-4 treasure token army to swing out with. And it synergizes really well in the decks where you can actually create duplicates. So Parallel Lives and Doubling Season in green. If you are in Simic, you also have the new commanders in Adrix and Nev Twin Casters. And if you are running three colors and using Esper for that, you also have Sylvie, Gavanic Genius, which lets you turn them into creatures and give them Death Touch and Lifelink. So yeah, swing for lethal with tokens is a thing you so can do. So you're, you're beating people to death with money in Ex- your exactly, capitalism yes. dot deck. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, so what you use is smothering tithe to oppress everybody to make treasure tokens, and then ultimately you then turn that money into your army, and then you beat them to death with their taxes. Well, this is incredibly depressing. Cool. So I also want to shout out listener Pipo Felipe. Sorry if I mispronounced your name there. He gave us a hint recently on some anti-treasure tech if you're running into too much of it in your graveyard with a really spicy nugget of a card, and that is Viridian Revel. I completely forgot this card existed. It is one green green for an enchantment. Whenever an artifact is put into an opponent's graveyard from the battlefield, you may draw a card. If we're going up against Big Daddy Corvald and he's sitting on a pile of treasure and he casts in 10 of them, sure, Corvald draws 10, but then so does, so do we. Felipe, th- that is a really cool recommendation, and finding these hidden gems is just so, so satisfying. When I was building my Sidri deck back when I first met you, John, I came across Viridian Rebel just looking at cards that interact with it. I bought one. I've never used it, and not until like this moment we pointed it out, I'm like, wow. This can completely hose my dragon treasure deck. I should probably be aware of it. (laughs) Yeah, it is a really cool card. And I see a lot of similarities with Compost, which is another green enchantment. This is for one generic and a green. And it says, whenever a black card is put into an opponent's graveyard, you may draw a card. And there are times when this has popped up as a like sideboard tech type of thing for certain metas in CEDH even. So I can definitely see if Wizards keeps pushing treasures, which, I mean, they just released an entire set that had treasure as one of the main mechanics, that card could definitely pop up and become more played. Yeah, seriously. Felipe, thank you very much for sharing this. It was a really cool, spicy piece of tech, and I'm glad we got to talk about it today. You can reach the crew from Gemstone Mine on Twitter at GemstoneMineMTG, or send us an email at GemstoneMinePodcast at gmail.com. On YouTube, we're Gemstone Mine Podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.